All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Today, I'm super glad to be talking with Mr. Valentin Tambosi. Uh, did I pronounce your name right? That's correct, man. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you have any kind of Hungarian origins by any chance? No, I do not. Most people ask me if I like speak Italian because of my last name. And um, the name uh -huh. Tambosi is actually from Brazil, but I don't speak any Portuguese or Italian. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because in Hungarian... Tomboshi Valentin, that would actually sound quite right. So when I okay. saw your name, I was like, yeah, yeah, this guy must have some Hungarian origins, but then no. <laughs> I, can't, I can't be mad at that. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, cool, man. So I think quite a few people in my audience will know who you are, but just in case some people don't, could you just let people know in a couple of sentences, like what should people know about you? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Valentin Tambosi and I've been training for about a decade now and my full-time job now is to basically coach bodybuilders. I take people, men and women, and put them on stage in hopefully their best, in, in their best conditioning. So that's basically what I do and I also am a speaker at the Intelligent Strength, Strength Program. It's a strength coach program in Vienna, Austria and that is basically my day-to-day -day business, yeah. Awesome. So are you training people online or in person or how does that work? I started out training people personally. So I was a personal trainer for about two or three years. And then I quickly transitioned into the online coaching market because I noticed that I would be able to have more clients and provide the same quality of coaching with online coaching. And I also do better with people that I can, that are more advanced and more intermediates than just beginners who have to learn to do the basic movements. Right. And you work at the famous Dust Gym in Vienna. Is that correct? That is correct. That is the gym in Vienna. And I do not necessarily work there, but I uh, train myself there. And a lot of my clients train there. And a lot of my clients that I'm coaching for the stage are training there. Right. So anytime I'm hearing someone talking about that gym, I'm noticing their tone changes all of a sudden. So it really sounds like it's one of those magical places for anybody who is passionate about fitness and training. Is, is that true? It is true. And I think the unique thing about this place is that you have strongmen, weightlifters, bodybuilders, uh, powerlifters, uh, calisthenics people. You have so many different people from different industries and different sports coming together and they just train next to each other and the great thing is you can pick everybody's brain and you might pick up something for your own sport that might be helpful for you and i think that is something very unique because usually you have a have like gyms that have a power lifters uh that are suited for power lifters or suited for bodybuilders and this gym is is suiting all of these people who are all training competitively for their competition so that is probably why so many people like that place when they go there. And we have people coming from all over the world pretty much every single day. And they all rave about this place. And it makes me, makes me very happy to see that. Right. It sounds like one of those places where there is no such thing as all the squat racks are being taken because there's just so many of them. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, we were just uh, talking with my girlfriend actually where we could uh, travel in some upcoming work break and we were like, yeah, we could go to Norway or Denmark and then I was like, no, no, we could go to Vienna and then I can be at the dust gym all the time. <laughs> and then she was like, well, then why don't you go on your own? I was like, yeah, yeah, fair point. <laughs> Dude, I, I, totally, I totally get it. And a lot of couples actually come to the gym. They stay at the gym. You can sleep at the gym. And, oh, damn. And they basically, some of them spend their honeymoon in Vienna at the gym and train twice a day okay. and then just midday go to the city and do something together. So um, this is actually quite common and a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of couples do that. So um, you guys are always welcome. Yeah, that sounds like a dream. Uh, to me, at least. I'm not sure about her. <laughs> <laughs> right. So... Um... So you mentioned that you've been training for a decade. Uh, would you would you say that you responded well to training genetically? I would I would say so. I wouldn't call myself like genetically gifted or something, but my my genetics are certainly above average. But the thing that really that really stands out to me when I started training, I really did some stupid thing like stupid stuff like everybody else when they started out training but it also taught me how to train hard right from the get-go and i think that was really really important right uh did you want to go on yeah sure so basically when i started out the first three months of training it was basically jumping right into a bro split freeway four-way split and that was just basically getting my feet wet when it comes to lifting weights and 
I was looking for like a program or some some guideline that helped me to focus for every training session and that helped me to like go into the gym with a purpose every single session and have a goal for every session. And then I stumbled upon Dog Crap Training by Dan Trudell. And some of the listeners probably know this training program. It's a fairly high frequency training program with rest pause, with a rest pause training technique where you take multiple smaller sets, mini sets to failure. And you also incorporate extreme stretching with every single muscle group. So it's certainly a highly advanced training program. And Dante Trudell himself, the creator of this program, prescribes a three years minimum training experience with this training program. And I was like, okay, I have three months training experience. I'm good. Let's jump right into it. And even though it was certainly not the best program at that time, um, that program stuck with me for almost two years. And I continued to make progress for two years. And I basically learned to be very stubborn with training and learn to maximize every single training session. And I learned, which is, I think, very important to learn after you've learned the basic movements. I've learned quickly how to train to muscular failure. And that is not that is certainly not a requirement for continued hypertrophy, but it taught me a certain mindset and taught me hard work. And I think those things are greatly underrated nowadays. And from that on, I basically use that mindset and put it into other training programs, more evidence-based approaches. I found out about Brett Schoenfeld. I found about, out about James Krieger and all those guys and started to incorporate some of their recommendations into my training. Right. So, um, so how does your training look like these days? So I, I've heard you mention somewhere that over time you had to shift away from being crazy focused on training to failure and you made your training a bit more voluminous, but more submaximal here and there. So yeah, how does that look like in practice? Yeah, so training volume, just like frequency and intensity, is a tool, and we have to appropriately implement it into in, into our training. So when people say, I'm a high volume guy, I'm a high frequency guy, I'm a high intensity guy, those people usually in my opinion, do not know exactly what they are talking about or how to implement those three things because they are just tools and everybody has to tailor those tools to their needs at their current training level. So right now my training volume is a lot higher than it was in the beginning of my training career because otherwise I would not be able to make continued progress. And that also means that I cannot incorporate as many sets to muscular failure as I did in the past. Obviously, if you're training with very... Uh, heavy weights with high, high intensity and close with a close proximity to muscular failure, your training volume can not be all that high. You can't have everything. You can't have high frequency, high volume, and high intensity all at once. So all those things have to fluctuate and go up and go down depending on what the other variable is doing. So with my current training volume, it's fairly high. Uh, we're talking 20 plus sets for pretty much every single muscle group. And I train five days a week and I incorporate a legs push-pull split with one day off and then repeat. Right. And how far do you generally stay away from failure? So if we look at those 20 plus sets in your training, then how many of those sets are being taken closer to failure? And then what's the most amount of reps that you would ever leave in the tank in any given set? Sure, that's a good question. I think the bigger the movement and the heavier the load you're using, the greater the injury risk. So we're talking about one to two reps in reserve with the bigger movements, squats, deadlifts, rows, and with something like an isolation movement, laterals, curls, extensions, stuff like that, I would push most of them very close to failure or maybe keep one rep in reserve if I can notice like technique execution breakdown to to an extent and i think this is a very good way to go about things because it just allows you to safely maximize what you can get out of a compound movement and then go all out on the isolation exercises which are done on cables machines with dumbbells and are fairly safe to begin with right uh where do you tend to fall on the free weight heavy basics versus really feeling the muscle and taking it through its range of motion in the perfect way so kind of that free weight versus machines and cables type of argument that seems to go on uh, on the internet fitness world so yeah where do you tend to fall on that one well i think there's there's always a discussion going on and what on what you should use for a particular muscle group or if you should like use more compounds more machines more cables first of all we have to 
establish one fact, your muscle does not know what is creating, what it has to create tension for, whether it's a cable, a dumbbell, a barbell, a trap bar, a machine, whatever it may be, your muscle only knows, okay, we have to create a certain amount of tension. And whatever allows you to create the most amount of tension is what I would go with. So we can certainly agree that a dumbbell kickback is not gonna going to allow you to create as much tension as a dip or a close grip bench press in your triceps. But then again, if we're looking at certain machines, if you're looking at an incline chest press machine, um, some people, because the setup is so more stable, can create a ton of tension with that machine in their shoulder girdle, in their chest, and in their triceps. So we cannot necessarily say that only free weight movements um, are have to be used or are always superior to machines and cables. We just have to look at each individual muscle and we have to look at the individual and what they can train the hardest on. So I would usually with clients when they start out with me, I obviously go with most free weight compound movements just to see where they're good at basically and how what muscle uh, what movements allows them to feel the muscle the most and as far as my muscle connection goes i really wouldn't focus on that too much with the free weight compounds because if i'm doing a heavy romanian deadlift all i'm focusing on is to not break apart right i don't really think about oh my god can i feel my hamstring contract in this part or can i feel my lower back here or can i feel my upper trap contract. All I think about is stay safe, stay stable, and just move the weight from A to B, basically. And that is something I throw out the window when I do a isolation exercise. I focus a lot on what the muscle feels like, how it stretches, how it squeezes, and how I create a good quality contraction. So I think we have to separate between compounds and isolation movements regarding uh, what a muscle feels like and how hard we can make it contract. Right. So how do you like to monitor your progression over time? So do you look to see a certain rate of progression in weight or reps, or do you just look to exhaust the muscles? Because I've heard you kind of mention somewhere training by feel sometimes. So yeah, what sort of objective criteria, if any, do you like to use to see that you're actually progressing and any kind of objective indications that you look to see as to know when to up the weight and these kinds of things? Sure. When I say going by feel or training by feel, I certainly do that only with myself because I know myself quite well and I know what works for me. And I absolutely hate to use these terms because these are usually the terms that you read in a muscular development magazine or some other muscle magazine and when the, when the pros talk about their training. And the reason they can train like that is because, first of all, they're obviously genetically gifted. They are using exogenous hormones. And as well, they are just very good at knowing their own body. A lot of people do not have that connection and they cannot just go by feel or do what works for them. So when I say those things, I'm specifically specifically talking about myself and because I have a certain amount of experience that I can work with. When we're talking about clients, I certainly have every single one of my clients log their training, every single session, every lift. And we do this to collect data. And with that data, we can make better and smarter decisions over time. Because if we can see, hey, this movement um, is stalling quickly, we might you still use that movement, but we do not train it as frequently as we do other movements where the client is able to progress on a decent rate. So logging your lifts, in my opinion, is something not just a power lifter should do. Everybody who's interested in max hypertrophy should log their training and should get a good idea of how many sets um, per muscle group they can handle recovery-wise and how fast certain movements can be pushed as far as progressive overload goes. As far as... Um, progression itself um, I use a fairly a fairly simple approach and usually tell clients that we want to emphasize load progressions first and try to get stronger every single session either in weight or in reps and if that is no longer possible we might add some volume to that lift and see if if that gives us some benefit and then scale back the volume again and try to get stronger on that particular movement again Right. Uh, now, I've heard you mention somewhere that your training sessions are running quite long these days, and it's not uncommon for you to be in the gym for three to four hours. And I know that that's a common thing amongst powerlifters, but earlier on, I always thought that when a natural trainee training for hypertrophy says that, they are just it's just some shit that they're making up. <laughs> but since I've heard it from you, I want to ask you, so what takes so long? Like, why can't you just be done in an hour and a half or two hours? What, what takes up those three to four hours? 
Very good question. And I think the one thing I have to add to that is that the fact that I train at Dust Gym <laughs> makes the training sessions longer all by itself. And I've heard that from people that visited the gym. Um, it's For me, obviously, it's not about looking around and getting to know the gym because I'm pretty much there every single day. But I know so many people there that my rest periods automatically are longer because I chat with so many people. Now, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't train close to the same amount at a different gym because what I've noticed um, with the beginning of 2018 when Cliff Wilson was briefly taking over my training and I was training at the highest training volumes I've ever I've ever done is the moment I've increased my rest periods to a certain extent and they turned out to be pretty, pretty long we're talking about like eight minutes between a compound movement um, I noticed that I was growing a lot better I was doing more volume obviously but in order to recover within that session from that volume and be able to handle the workload and to have pretty dramatic strength gains in that time period as well the thing i attribute that to are the rest periods and i think this is a very underrated fact because we used to think that shorter rest periods are better for hypertrophy and that is certainly not true and there's more research coming out on this that the longer you rest the better off you basically are. And the only limiting factor here is obviously time. A lot of people do not have time to train three, four hours, five days a week. I mean, that is crazy time investment you have to make. And um, I think if you can increase your rest periods to a certain extent, that will only benefit you. Yeah, this is actually sort of a mystery that I want to uncover this year. And I talked about it here and there, and I'm also reading a lot about this at the moment, which is, does it really matter how high, quote unquote, the quality of your sets are? Or is it just a matter of exhausting your muscles and pushing them close to failure? Like, is it the case that an 8RM is an 8RM regardless of how much weight you're lifting? And if that's the case, then does it really matter how long you're resting between sets? Or you can just complete your sets in whatever fashion you want. And the point is that you're just exhausting the muscles. So yeah, it's super interesting topic to me. I don't know what you're thinking of that. I, I, I definitely agree with you there. If we look at an 8RM set in isolation, that is certainly true. But if we're looking at numerous sets that are, let's say, close to your 8RM, right? And maybe you do an 8RM set and then you do a few down sets. And that would require a higher work capacity, obviously, than doing one 8RM set. And rest periods dramatically change how those preceding down sets look like because you will obviously have to be recovered for every single one of these downsets and the longer you rest the more recovered you will be and the more reps you will get on these subsequent sets and the higher training volume the higher your training volume will be within that given session which should result in more hypertrophy and and do you think that if you were to compensate by doing a few more sets i mean this is just a theoretical kind of brainstorming thing but do you think that if you were to drop the load rest shorter but compensate by doing more sets then eventually you would achieve the same thing so yes, your volume load would drop, but you would compensate by adding in a few more extra sets with those short rest periods. Do you think that you would achieve the same thing? Well, we are just theorizing here, but I think I would not grow as well because I would create so much more aerobic stress that probably my recovery would suffer and then my sessions in the following days would also suffer from that recovery depth. So I think we have to not just look at a one a one single training session in isolation, but we have to look at like a training week, a training, a full training muscle cycle, and then make uh, the proper decisions. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you there. Yeah. So um, I just heard you recently on Ryan Solomon's channel talking about twice daily training. And I've always had this romantic fantasy in my head that one day <laughs> I will have this home gym and I will be training there twice or three times a day and every single calorie that I will ingest will go towards muscle growth and it will be amazing. Yeah. Every single set that I will be doing will be completely fresh and yeah, it's just kind of the perfect world for a trainee. Um, is this just a fantasy? Like what can you tell us about twice daily training? I think um, I've had the same romanticizing thoughts about training twice a day or numerous times a day. And in the beginning, it was a lot of fun. I've did it, I, didn't even, I didn't even manage to do it for a full month because I got sick and tired of it after like three weeks. And the thing with training numerous times a day is you, can cert you have certainly a lot more freedom when it comes to how you split up your training and how much volume you can do within one of these uh, training sessions per day. But you have to look at 
some very basic life stuff. <laughs> um, if you do not have a home gym, you have to get to the gym not once a day, but twice a day. So there's more commuting involved and you will just get, in my opinion, tired of that first before you get tired of training. Um, secondly, you just have to manage it properly and manage your day in a different way because getting to the gym twice means you have to make time for that. And even though the training sessions themselves are shorter, you still have to think about how you put that into your day and make it part of your day um, numerous times a week. So very often when it comes to training, what is optimal is on paper is not so much optimal when it comes to reality and how to implement that in real life with real people. And I think training numerous times a day is one of those topics where you can certainly see that. Right. And and would you say that that's the main issue, uh, the logistical stuff? Because I've, I've also tried it here and there when I had more time. And what I found is that just simply the brain power that I had to dedicate to making this happen logistically, like normally when I would go to the gym, like on my normal once a day schedule, then it's still some brain power because I have to keep in mind like, oh, damn, like, will I, will I make it there before rush hour? Is it going to work out conveniently? But then I'm there and then it's done. And then with two a days, then it was this constant extra worry that I had to be mindful of throughout the day. So would you say that it's the travel time, the logistics and the extra brain power that is going to burn people out before the actual training would? Absolutely, because the training itself would be uh, much more regimented and you would have split up sessions and actually recovery would be a lot better. But this once again goes back to the, the most basic thing of, of it all when it comes to training or nutrition or whatever it may be, and that is adherence. And if your adherence um, is not there and it, it will suffer over time in my experience, and I've also tried it with some clients, that training twice a day sounds great on paper, but most people cannot stick to it. Right. So I'll, I'll hold that off until I have a home gym then. <laughs> uh, awesome. So, um, okay. So why don't we go into some specific body parts and exchange a few thoughts on how to train them best, what exercises are best, what rep ranges are best, that kind of stuff. Uh, does that work? Oh, I love it, man. Absolutely. Awesome. Cool. So let's start with the most obvious one, uh, chest. Chest. Okay. So when it comes to training your chest, one thing I've emphasized over the years is uh, paused pressing for the simple reason that I see some people are very sloppy with the pressing mechanics and we can work on that by simply pausing at the bottom and a lot of people also when it comes to mobility and range of motion are not able to lower the weight all the way to their chest a lot of people are and they should certainly train their over full range of motion but a lot of people when they're doing a barbell bench press are not able to touch the chest to the bar so with those people, I like to incorporate Spoto presses, so named after Eric Spoto, the powerlifter. And we are basically pausing the weight a few inches off your chest, where the person is able to get into a good position where they're not compensating the execution, where they're not pressing out of the bottom with the front delt, so only their triceps, but with actually their pecs, their chest. And they learn to control the barbell in a very disadvantageous position where they're usually weakest. And that allows them to, first of all, feel their chest a lot better because they're actually training the chest over its active range of motion and not other muscles. And they also become very disciplined with pressing. And that leads to less injury risk. And this is usually something I notice with a lot of people that their shoulder issues all stem from shitty pressing, basically. <laughs> and they do not pay attention to... Um, their execution on presses and then they are feeling their shoulder hurt during laterals or curls or extensions and it's usually the pressing that is the reason for that so pulse pressing is a big one with chest training and as far as exercise selection go usually i mean the usual suspects come come to mind here um we're talking barbell bench presses flat bench presses uh, with the with the dumbbell, um, incline presses, uh, different machines that fit the person's structure and that allows them to train the pecs heavily. And as far as isolation movements, I'm not a big fan of dumbbell flies because of their resistance profile and the top half of the movement is basically not a whole lot of resistance on your chest. So I like to incorporate machines there because they also allow a safer setup and uh, cable flies on the cable tower. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the chest press machine there. You're kind of echoing my own sentiments there because I've also grew fond of using a good chest press machine that suits you biomechanically. And yeah, I just found that during bench pressing, just half my attention is focused on pushing the weight up and then the other half is focused on not injuring my shoulder 
or keeping them non achy throughout the movement. So yeah, I guess that's not the best scenario for muscle growth. Well, we just uh, yeah, go ahead. We just have to we just have to keep longevity in mind, right? And when we're talking or looking at people that gotten really strong on certain movements when it comes to pressing, they all been injured, and they they all been injured as far as the shoulders go, the rotator cuff, their their chest. And we can avoid that if we are just um, being smart about our exercise selection and what particular exercise fits an in, in individual structure. And also you mentioned chest press machines. Um, what I do quite often with people that do not feel their chest quite well with free weight movements, I start them off with um, a chest press machine because it's a much more stable setup and they can just focus on pushing the weight away and they do not have to stabilize a whole lot. And then for the second movement, we go into some free weight pressing, whether it's dumbbells or barbells, um, also paused, that allows them to basically have a pre-fatigued, or I really don't like that word, but a primed muscle, basically, to feel that muscle a lot more when they are doing a heavier free weight compound. Right. Awesome. So cool. Then, uh, yeah, let's get into the next bro body part, uh, arms. So biceps, triceps. Sure. So... People always compliment me on my on my arms, and obviously this is this is something that I've been as far as my triceps goes. Um, it's mostly genetics. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I have to be honest because when I when I started out training, I did a whole lot of dips, and dips are some of the is something that has worked very well for me. But a lot of people do not feel um, good as far as their shoulder health goes when they do a whole lot of dips, and the shoulders hurt. They feel way too much in the pecs. They don't really can hit. They are, they are triceps isolated. So as far as arms, I know we'll start with triceps, is we certainly want to emphasize heavy pressing, but we also have to remember that the triceps is working a whole lot already doing our chest pressing. So as far as volume goes, we certainly do not have to do um, as much pressing volume for our triceps as we already do chest pressing. So um, I would emphasize overhead movements where we train the long head of the triceps and also focus on movements um, that have like that involve shoulder extension because the long head of the triceps is also involved in that anatomically. So I would train the triceps with movements, for example, on a machine or on cables like that. And as far as biceps goes, I I would say this is a weak body part for me. I just store a whole lot of fat there, and they look bigger <laughs> when I'm in the off season. So when I diet down after a couple of weeks, my arms just disappear, and people are like, "What happened?" Well, I store a whole lot of fat on my biceps. That's it, basically. And the 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 thing with biceps is, um, since we have we, since we're dealing with the elbow joint, just as we do with the with the triceps, we have to find movements that align with the elbow joint as far as the biceps goes. So. The biceps obviously flexes the elbow and it also supinates the wrist. And what we can do is look at exercises that do not cause too much elbow issues or elbow pain at all um, and work in that plane. So with 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 biceps training, I do not do a whole lot of e-spar or barbell curls because most people cannot fit into that plane. So I emphasize cables, uh, dumbbells, and try to put the... The muscle, since it's a very small joint, first of all, and a very small muscle, and and emphasize that we can train that muscle pain free first and foremost. Yeah, my arm training is not exciting at all. Like my elbows are really sensitive, and since I already have a fair amount of pressing and pulling in my training, I'm doing I'm using a lot of blood flow restriction, just really high reps. So yeah, it's not the most aesthetic, exciting type training. Absolutely, and one thing you can like also incorporate that, and I know you've um, you've talked about this, is uh, myo reps with with isolation exercise for your arms, because first of all, it's very time efficient, and it is a lot more fun to do something like that instead of like six sets of dumbbell curls. I don't know about you, but curling itself is something I absolutely hate. Um, it's not fun. It's not very exciting. Um, it's just plain boring. I just get it done basically. So. Um, shortening that down to like one or two my rep sets and having a very high training density and doing all that work in a few in a few sets like that is probably something that might help with adherence over time when you do not like to train your biceps. Yeah, I also hate curling. <laughs> uh, cool. Then my favorite body part up next: so side and rear deltoids. Yeah, man. Um, I I could talk about those body parts all day because I've basically obsessed over them over the last three years and really wanted to achieve a certain look with 
my side delts and my rear delts. So the thing that people often mention with, with those particular muscle groups is that if you are a natural bodybuilder, you cannot grow these muscle groups very well because you do not have as much androgen receptors there, and therefore you will never look like somebody who is um, enhanced. Well, that is to an extent certainly true, but you can still grow your side delts and your rear delts, absolutely. And the biggest problem I see with that is how people sequence their exercises with these particular muscle groups and what exercises they select. So what we usually see for delts, if we just put everything into one basket, is people emphasize pressing overhead. And overhead pressing is certainly a great way um, to basically get stronger overall. It basically involves your entire body. If you're doing a military press, you have to squeeze your glutes, you have to lock your knees. Everything works from your toes up to your head. So that is great for a beginner. That is great for an intermediate to just get stronger overall. But if we're looking at how and what muscles we stimulate with that with that exercise, we are doing a lot of triceps, we're doing a lot of front delt, we're doing a little side delt and pretty much zero rear delt. So since the rear delt is usually lacking in everybody, um, we would like to emphasize that muscle and that part of the delt more, in my opinion. That means when training delts, I usually start out with the rear delt and then go on to side delts. And with that exercise sequence alone, we are already emphasizing the weakest part of the delts. And we are also approaching training that muscle with a different mindset because we are prioritizing the part that is weakest. And as far as rear delts goes, um, bent over lateral variations on the cable with dumbbells. I also like to do rear delt rows where you're basically keeping your scapula fixed and try to achieve max shoulder extension because as soon as the elbow goes past your midline of your body, it's no longer lats or traps. It's pretty much only rear delt. And if you, if you practice this movement, you will get very well at feeling and targeting your rear delt with basically a cable row. And... As far as side delts goes, obviously I talk a lot of a lot about lateral raises because I think the lateral raise should be part of everybody's hypertrophy program and they just have to be perfectly executed and that is usually a big problem. Uh, it's in my opinion the most budget exercise out there next to dumbbell rows and when I look at people executing a lateral raise and then say they don't really hit my shoulders i'm not really surprised <laughs> because you're doing them wrong so um, as far as lateral raises goes i do a lot of those in different rep ranges and what i've also noticed over the years with myself and clients is that higher rep ranges and we're talking talking up to 30 to 40 reps is that the delts really really like those rep ranges i mean it's not fun to train like that and it's very hard and you're producing a lot of metabolic stress and it's grueling but the delts really respond well to those higher rep ranges and a high training density and high training volumes within a given training session. Right. Uh, what do you think about the overlap? So some people say that if you're doing plenty of pull-ups and rows and things like that, then your rear delts are going to get a lot of love anyway. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? That's an interesting, interesting, interesting observation. And I think what I've noticed over the years is that people that do not – target their lats well usually do a lot with their red delts and people that do not well with targeting their red delts have usually pretty impressive lats so when it comes to rowing and pull-ups and other basic movements we just have to look at what this person is targeting the most and is shifting tension to the most and i mean if you are hitting a whole lot of red delt with your with your rows, um, you're probably not rowing that much because the red delt itself is not big. So the traps would take over, the lats would take over, the rhomboids would do more work than a small muscle like the red delt. And I think if you want to achieve max hypertrophy with these more aesthetically pleasing muscle groups like side and red delts, you certainly have to incorporate some isolation movements. Right. And uh, yeah, in the beginning, you just mentioned that a lot of people only do overhead pressing. Uh, do you, Is this something that you're incorporating into your own training at the moment? Or when you're training with a bodybuilder, do you incorporate that? So yeah, what about the overhead press? Um, I do currently not as far as basically standing vertical presses, but I do a high incline press for my chest. And what's really surprising to me is that I actually feel my upper chest a lot more when I do very steep inclines instead of like a 45 degree incline and that also hits the front delt to a sufficient degree and it also is not as taxing on my lower back like a perfectly vertical military press would be 
and that keeps my lower back fresh for deadlifting and squatting. Right. And you mentioned that it's important to prioritize these muscle groups. Does this actually mean then that you're doing more volume for them than for other muscle groups? I would say as far as volume, certainly because it's linked to the rep ranges. And since the rep ranges are usually higher than I do for other rep, uh, for other muscle groups, I do not do like 30, 30 reps on a leg extension or a leg press. So um, based on that, the volume, the training volume for delts is automatically higher. And they also recover pretty good from those higher rep ranges so and also keeps your shoulders safer if you're doing like heavy upright rows your shoulders might not like that as much as doing a high rep set with a much lighter weight awesome so uh, let's talk about some anti-bro body parts then so uh quads everybody's most dreaded body part to train Oh yeah. Um, so quads, quads, quads are also interesting. And I would say with quads, what I've noticed over time is that when I look at somebody's squat and that they're squatting mechanics, most people just rush the eccentrics. And I think that is a big disadvantage when you want to load the quad because then they just dump down into the hole and somehow stand up and they don't really know what they're using to stand up so as far as squatting goes and as far as squat training goes i would emphasize a very controlled eccentric i would i would emphasize it with every muscle group certainly but even more so with quads because it just allows you to focus on what you're loading as you go down that that's the case for a leg press for a hex squat for a free weight squat whatever you use to target your squat uh, your quads and the other thing with quads is that if you're really squatting heavy, you do not really really need a whole lot of volume. I mean, it obviously has to go up as you're getting more and more advanced and more stimulus is required over time. But um, a lot of people like do two sets of squats and then they do a shitload of leg extensions. And I don't think that is needed um, because you just, if you emphasize proper squatting mechanics, your quads work a whole lot during a free weight squat. And as far as free weight squatting goes, some people are just not made for that. We have to, um, we just have to accept that. Some people are not made for free weight squatting, and those people, if they're not powerlifting, if they're not weightlifting, should not free weight squat. Not everybody has to do an ass to grass free weight squat. They can do a hack squat. They can do a Smith machine squat and lock themselves into per, in, into a certain position that allows them to train the muscle over full range of motion where the muscle is fully done from at the bottom and then come up without their hips shooting back and they basically doing a good morning so with exercise exercise selection is certainly a big one as well with quads and the people need people out there need to be a bit more honest with themselves as far as exercise selection goes for quads because um, if you go to movement as a trainer for each and every one of your clients is the free weight squat, um, you will run into trouble. And some people will mostly train their lower back and some will train their quads. But if you want to really target the, the quads, um, you just have to find an exercise that fits the person and their structure. Right. Uh, do you do leg extensions at all for the quads or do you just uh, swear by the big hard hitters like squats, hex squats, leg presses, etc.? I do leg extensions and I I like to I like to do them unilaterally just to to have some extra um, extra balancing as far as uh, hypertrophy and development of each side goes and I also like to do unilateral free weight movements like split squats reverse lunges for for quads. Yeah, uh, Bulgarian split squats. I guess they must score as one of the most hated exercises ever by most trainees, but. If you get into the groove of it, then it's an absolutely brutal and amazing exercise for the quads. So, for for sure, and the the, the interesting thing about uh, split squats and any unilateral lower body training is that no matter if you're beginner, intermediate, or advanced, everybody hates them the same way, yeah. and they are as taxing to everybody. So you would think, hey, you would you get better over the over the, over the course of your training career uh, doing split squats, and you're not. <laughs> you just obviously you can execute the movement, but it just is always as hard as it get, as it gets. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, then other side of the legs. So hamstrings. Oh yeah. Hamstrings. So I'm um, certainly a muscle group. I absolutely love to train because I think it's, it's one of those muscle groups that makes your physique stand out on stage if it's well-developed and 
Um, as far as knee health, I think hamstring training is very important as well, and they should not be an afterthought like so many people treat them in their training. You see, when you look at a, at a training program of some people, when they train their legs, they have a bunch of squats in their leg presses, leg extensions, and then they throw in three sets of leg curls, and that's about it. So I would certainly emphasize hamstring curls at the beginning of my training because it's a great way to warm up the knee joint without directly taxing the front of your leg, your quads. Um, so most of my clients leg curl before they squat and that helps them with like go into a squat set with a fully pumped hamstring and it also feels better at the bottom of a squat. They just sit into a pumped muscle and they feel a lot more stable at the bottom of a squat. And other exercises I would obviously incorporate with hamstrings are um, Romanian deadlifts. Romanian deadlifts, no matter what variation you want to choose, whatever fits you best. I currently perform them with a barbell and a dumbbell, both heavy, and they can be loaded in pretty much any rep range. I mean, I would shy away from higher rep ranges than 15 because your lower back will usually give out first. But um, Romanian deadlifts are certainly an exercise that is absolutely fantastic for the entire posterior chain. No matter if you're using dumbbells, barbells, a trap bar, you can use like um, a car deadlift machine to perform them. There's many ways you can load the back of your leg and they are very, very beneficial as far as uh, development of your posterior chain goes and mobility in your hips. Right, right. Uh, one thing that you might be able to give me some tips on actually is I love the Romanian deadlift. I think it's a fantastic exercise, but I always notice that over a certain level of intensity, I just completely lose the kind of mind-muscle connection with my hamstrings. And it almost feels like it's no longer a hamstring exercise and all my attention just goes into not breaking in half, basically. So I, I just have to focus like crazy on keeping my backs straight or arched, not letting the bar drift forward. The whole thing just feels hard and awkward and I just don't really feel like the target muscle is being worked anymore. And when I look back at videos that I shoot of me doing it, then the form actually looks intact. But at the same time, the movement just feels super awkward and hard without actually feeling like the target muscles are working. So yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? I basically feel the exact same way when I do a heavier set. And I always record my RDL sets, especially my heavier ones, because I want to see what is going on and how it feels in correlation to that. And what I usually notice is that when my back feels round as hell, then I'll take a look at the video at the last rep and it's pretty much perfectly straight. We are talking about a very neutral, safe spine and I actually could continue pulling. And that is something I have to work on over time because obviously I want to stay injury free, but I also want to maximize my potential and do more reps when I'm in a safe and stable position. So I have, I do this with clients as well, that they have to record exercises again and again, where they have this particular feeling, where they feel like they're breaking in half. And when you look at the video, everything is fine. It actually looks quite easy, even in the end, at the end of the set. So I would certainly would, I would certainly try to do that if I, if I were you and record my sets and see over time if you get better working closer and closer to failure and just see how you perceive certain positions in your spine. And it also goes back to what we mentioned earlier as far as mind muscle connection goes. I really do not focus so much if I like feel my hamstring stretch on an RDL. I mean, it certainly stretches. Obviously, I wouldn't get into that position, uh, but it's not like, okay, I feel it here or I feel it there. I just focus on staying stable and not breaking in half like you mentioned. Yeah, one thing that I considered on RDLs is either just training much more submaximally. So instead of pushing for one or two reps shy of failure, then just set a total rep target for the first set. So normally in the first set, I would do eight reps. And instead of that, I would just do five reps pretty submaximally, then rest a minute and then do the remaining three reps. And then by working much more submaximally, then I can keep a closer eye on how it feels and the form. And then the other idea was to do them single legged perhaps, and maybe then the lower back and the issues related to just holding the bar even with straps, <laughs> are no longer going to be such a limiting factor. So I don't know. Have you considered any of those? Uh, I did, but I think they cannot be loaded as heavily, obviously, because you're having a less, much less stable setup. And I would probably incorporate them with somebody that has to work on some hip issues or some mobility issues. And 
um, that would that would be certainly make sense. A lot of power lift is still single leg RDLs, for example, and it has great benefit. But as far as hypertrophy goes, and everything is fine with either side of your leg, I would not do too much of them. Right, right, okay. Uh, well, actually, one thing uh, I forgot to ask you is, do you have any kind of preference in terms of ratios between hip hinging and leg curling movements? I would say it's pretty much 50-50, and it really depends on how heavy I want to load the RDL. The heavier I load it, the more the ratio goes down, and the more leg curling I would do. Um, but I would certainly say the bread and butter for hamstrings are leg curls and RDLs, and if you have the equipment available i would also throw in something like uh, ghr which is a great movement um, we just have to like most people just do some crazy stuff on there and swing around and really really work the lower back more than their than the back of the leg so we just we we could throw those in there as well um if they are executed correctly awesome all right then uh, what about calves Calves. Oh yeah. So calves is one of those, uh, is obviously that one muscle group where everybody gives up at a certain time in their training career and they just stop training them. And I think, um, I totally understand it. First of all, I've been there myself, but I think if we want to, if we want to take ourselves seriously and want to develop everything as best as we can, even though that muscle groups grows painfully slow, we still have to train it, obviously. Just because it grows slower than other muscle groups, and there's research on that, um, we still should train the calf muscles. So the biggest thing with calf muscles are two things. The first one is execution, and the second one is range of motion. First one with execution is most people shift the weight out to their small, uh, to their little toe, and they basically... They basically do not train the gastrocnemius, the biggest calf muscle. And what you want to do is you basically want to collapse your midfoot and pronate it and shift all the tension to the ball of your big toe. And when you do that, you will notice immediately how your, how your calves basically cramp up if you go all the way up. And if you do not feel like that, you are not maximally shortening the calf. And very often have people like do body weight calf raises and they cramp after 10 reps. And it's because they have never done a proper calf raise in their entire life. And that brings me to the second point, which is range of motion. People think that if they go up to a certain extent, that is all there is to the range of motion in the in the foot joint. And since it's such a small joint, it's hard to judge from the outside if you have achieved full range of motion. For example, if you're doing a dumbbell curl, we can see if you're all the way up or not, right? We can see if it's partial range of motion or full range of motion for that particular muscle. But with something like a calf raise, it's very hard to judge, hey, could you go up a little bit higher? And every little, every little... Um, distance you do not cover with a calf raise um, is basically you're doing less work and therefore working the muscle less and therefore producing less overall hypertrophy. So those are the two, the two biggest things with calves, execution, range of motion. If you really nail those, um, stuff like rep sets and all that comes after that, you just have to be very disciplined with your execution and your range of motion. It took me probably the last three or four years to really nail that down and understand it and implement it into my training. And then you just basically have to train them. And I would also recommend to people to train them at the beginning of their leg training or even other other training sessions, but do not do them less because you will get sloppy. You will do less sets. You will be less intense with your sets when you do them at the end of your training session. So if you want to grow them, start your training with calf races. It's a, basically a great warm up, and then go into the rest of your session. Yeah, calves are just one of those things that have just an insane genetic component. And for me personally, I don't have great calves genetically, but they are okay. But I just noticed that after a certain point, they just didn't grow anymore. And I'm training them relatively diligently, but they just don't bulge. So I guess it's just one of those things that take time. Absolutely. It's not very motivating training a muscle group over and over again properly and seeing very little results. Yeah. But um, if you stick to it and basically... Um, switch to autopilot, make sure your execution is on point, make sure your range of motion is on point, and get it over with at the beginning of a training session. I think that is the best approach to um, to grow them. All right. Uh, what about something that most people don't consider, which is traps? Traps. Okay, so traps are... The traps are a huge muscle. So we have the upper, mid, and lower traps, and they all have 
vastly deferring functions as far as muscle contraction goes, and they stable they, they stabilize our scapula and they are involved basically in everything where we isometrically load the back. And I think the greatest growth potential they have is exactly in that with isometrically heavy loads. So if we're looking at the back of a power lift or a strongman, what do they usually do? They carry around stuff and it's not from dynamic contractions. So um, uh, most power lifters I look at in our gym have pretty impressive traps and they deadlift a few times a week. We also have quite a few strongmen at our gym and they carry stuff around. They do not do rows with a with an atlas stone. They carry the atlas stone or put it put it over over an obstacle. So with with traps I think we want to emphasize heavy posterior chain loading, deadlifts, remaining deadlifts um, and those by itself will do most of the work. Um, we also something I've talked about recently is like pausing reps at the bottom of a row where you where you al- it allows you to recuperate yourself mid set and basically refocus again on pulling the weight as strictly as possible back and that will also that hanging that dead hang at the bottom position of a row will also help you to emphasize the loading of the traps and that in itself is a very very powerful stimulus when you have the traps all stretched out in that position and then pull from there so basically not a whole lot of isolation exercise for for traps i don't do shrugs for traps because it usually ends up in neck issues and i just get headaches from that Um, but i would emphasize deadlifts and heavy rows for basically your upper back Right. Uh, then what about everybody's favorite body part to train? Uh, well, actually, that's not true. It's not everybody's favorite body part. It's something that almost every beginner will do very diligently when they start out in, in the gym. And then as they become more advanced, they typically will taper it down. And then most advanced trainees don't swear by this at all, which is direct app training. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, good, good one, man. Um, this is probably one, and I might sound like a hypocrite here, because earlier I said, okay, we want to train every muscle group and maximize its hypertrophy potential as far as calves goes and stuff like that and, and genetically weaker body parts. Um, I personally do not train my abs directly for the very simple reason that I've done several runs in training programs where I've targeted them specifically and where I kept my nutrition the same, where I made sure that body composition in itself is not making them look differently and i've noticed zero difference as far as aesthetics goes from direct app training and the people what i've noticed the people that swear by direct app training usually have very good apps to begin with <laughs> you take you take pictures at uh, of them when they were kids and you can basically see a six pack at them uh, on the beach and they have never trained a single day in their life so uh, when we're talking about direct app training i would be very skeptical about how much it really does for somebody that is interested in max muscle development and i think that the core or the apps in itself are there to basically avoid movement and stabilize the trunk more than anything else and that stuff like crunches and hanging leg raises and stuff like that um, may be beneficial for somebody who's more interested in max strength but not so much in um, aesthetics yeah, it's, it's one of those things that if direct app training does do something, then someone like me would definitely benefit from it because, you know, basically I'm an advanced trainee. If you look at my strength levels and how close am I to my theoretical genetic limits, but my abs and my core basically look untrained. Like it basically just didn't change from the first day that I stepped into the gym until now. So if app training does do something, then I would definitely want to know about it because having good abs is one of those things that if you go to the beach and you have nothing else well-developed, but you have this nice blocky set of abs, which is just genetically there for you, then the average person is going to look at you and say, damn, like that that guy looks really muscular. And it's like, well, no, not really. You just have this genetic strong point, which is your blocky abs and maybe a good body fat distribution. So if app training does do something, then I would definitely want to do it. But if there is a chance that it doesn't actually really do anything, then it just sucks so badly to train them, then I would just not do it probably. So yeah, it sucks. Dude, absolutely. I think I think it's uh, for a lot of people, it's a wasted effort and they could get better in other muscle groups um, much faster if they would just focus less on apps. And I mean, there's nothing lost if you do a couple of sets of apps after, after your upper body sessions or something. But I think a lot of people, a lot of people will not get a whole lot of uh, out of of those movements, right? So um, yeah, I guess we skipped glutes. Uh, do you have anything for those? 
No, not really. I mean, the last few years, the last, I don't know, five years, six years, there was a, a, a hype surrounding the hip thrusts and everybody all of a sudden started doing hip thrusts. Um, there is a I do not do hip thrusts and do not incorporate it into training programs for clients. There's a great video by Chris Duffin, the power lifter, where he basically analyzes and uh, gives an example why the hip thrust is not optimal for heavy loading. I certainly see a benefit of using the hip thrust in a moderate rep range, like 10 reps plus. But when I see people do like a, a triple on a hip thrust and never achieving full hip extension, I'm just asking myself, what are, what are, what's your goal here? What are you doing? And I would certainly, for, for glute growth, I would certainly emphasize uh, single leg movements, lunges, squats, and deadlifts. Um, in my opinion, the squat is definitely superior to the hip thrust when it comes to training the glutes. And I, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. You see a lot of women do like uh, cable kickbacks and a lot of abduction and adduction stuff and um, hip thrusts and all these movements. And to me, when I look at uh, female bodybuilders on stage, their glutes often look more impressive and they do not do these uh, funky movements. They just squat and deadlift. And certainly we have to see if those movements fit that particular person. But um, the basics are, basi are the basics for a reason. And I do not think hip thrusts are a must for glutes. Yeah. And oh shit, we actually skipped one of the most important muscle groups, which is lats. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. So um, usually when it comes to developing a muscle group, I would not ask the guy that is genetically gifted when it comes to the muscle group. So I would be the wrong guy to ask about triceps uh -huh. <laughs> because I just dipped. I did a whole lot of dips. Uh, but as far as lats go, I think I can say a few things because my back used to be my weakest muscle group, um, especially my lats. And I had a very tough time tapping into that muscle and actually feeling the muscle. And... Um, over time, they've gotten a lot better, so especially in the last two years. And the thing with lats is we once again have to emphasize execution and how we think about elbow path and where we pull and basically what cues we use when we execute a lat movement. So with lats, we are not... Usually people think in terms of, hey, this... This movement trains a particular muscle group, but it really depends on how we execute a back exercise that tells us what it targets specifically. So for example, if we talk about a barbell row, a barbell row is a very poor movement for lat development. Um, it mainly loads your upper back, it loads your traps, it loads your mid-back, it loads your lower back. But when we look at how we pull and where we pull, we are not really stressing the lats to a max extent. So I would emphasize with lats, I will learn to lean to the side. For example, the dumbbell row is a perfect example of how you can teach somebody to properly train their lats because it involves um, scapular depression, pulling your shoulder blades down, extending the arm, shoulder extension, and leaning to the side, lateral flexion of the trunk. If we incorporate all these three things, your lat will be maximally shortened and you will certainly feel your lat contract. It's same with um, as it was with calves. If we can create a cramp-like contraction with that particular muscle group, we can be certain that we are obviously targeting that target muscle group. So with lats, I would start with something like dumbbell rows and really learn to maximally shorten that muscle. And then we can move into some other stuff um, like um, different rows. Rowing machines, especially unilaterally performed, are great at ways to target the lats. And one thing you really want to emphasize with lats is you want to push your elbow back and down. So instead of just thinking I want to pull back or up, I want to pull my, I want to think about like doing a triceps kickback at the same time and try to extend my, my, my arm at the same time, basically pulling my wrists down to the floor. And if we're talking, for example, a horizontal row, a cable row, and that will allow you to create a lot more tension in your lats than you would by just pulling the weight back, back is a very bad cue that is being used with lats. Because if you're pulling back, your traps will contract, your rhomboids will contract, everything in your back will contract, but you will not maximally isolate the lats as you pull back. So it's more like a pullover movement is also a great movement to teach somebody using their lats because there is uh, not a lot of movement going on in the elbow joint, but you're still extending at the shoulder and pulling the weight back and depressing your scapula first. And that is a great teaching tool to have somebody uh, properly target the lats. 
Right. And, and do you tend to prioritize horizontal or vertical pulling movements with the lats more so? Um, certainly horizontal for a simple reason it is harder and I've talked about these rows versus pull downs um, I think that movements like chin ups and pull ups are absolutely great movements because they are very tough and if you can do them certainly use a pull down and work your strength levels up until you can do a chin up or a pull, pull up but as far as advanced trainees that really want to maximize the results I would go with mostly horizontal pulling um, because you are able to use more load, and you're just performing a harder movement. You have to stabilize everything, your lower back is involved, and usually the stuff that is very hard gets you the better results than the stuff that it does not feel as hard. Um, that should certainly not mean that we should only go by feel, as we said in the beginning, but when I look at people with impressive backs, they are not doing a whole lot of pull downs. They are doing a lot of rows. They're doing cable rows. They're doing deadlifts. They're doing Romanian deadlifts. And that stuff uh, builds the posterior chain the most. Hmm, interesting. So you don't do weighted chin ups and things like that at the moment? Uh, currently, I'm at my heaviest weight, so I <laughs> cannot do a whole lot of extra loading <laughs> with my chin ups. Um, I basically go for reps with these and try to add reps every single session. And as soon as I've hit a certain rep target, I will start adding load to these again. But this is basically linked to your body weight. And since I'm still gaining weight, I basically add weight by food not by plates so i i simply i simply uh, try to get to a certain rep target and then go from there right uh, how tall are you and what do you weigh just out of curiosity um um five nine um so 170 centimeters and i weigh 95 kilos so i don't know how many pounds that is i think two eight 208 something like that yeah, something like that. Right. Okay, then uh, we are going to wrap, wrap it up in a second. But uh, if we went for this long, then we might as well make this the most comprehensive Valentin Tambosi interview ever. Sure. So uh, do you do any deloads in your program or how do you like to go about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, so deloads, in my opinion, are an absolute must. And every, every time I have a discussion about deloads and talk to a person that says, I do not deload, I ask them, okay, how did your last six months of training look like? And... Um, there's several answers I get. Um, usually the people are not training intensely at all for a certain amount of time. They just, they just have moderate training sessions and never really push the pace. Or they get sick somewhere, they go away for holiday or something like that. And then I ask them, what do you think like getting sick is? Or what do you think a holiday is? That's basically your body taking a deload because you didn't give it one. Or if you go on a holiday or take a light training week, that is a deload as well. So um, when people are not planning their deloads, um, the deloads will be implemented in another way. <laughs> your body takes the break for you because you have not been thinking deeply enough about your training to make time or room for a deload. So what I've noticed with clients and myself is that most people cannot go really balls to the walls for longer than eight weeks. There's some outliers to that. Obviously, I have some female clients that can train 12 weeks um, with a very with very high intensity. Um without a problem and then have to deload. But most people, I would say no longer than eight weeks. I personally have to deload every four to five weeks and I auto-regulate it. I can basically by now I can see it coming and I just notice in my last few sessions when I have to take a break. I nowadays approach deloads a bit differently than I did in the past and Cliff Wilson has really um, influenced me on this a lot. In the past I would take something that you see in powerlifting or in other sports with deloads. I reduce the training volume, I reduce the training load to a certain extent so less weight on the bar and basically maintain um, my training sessions. So overwork goes down, but I still go to the gym. Nowadays, I don't do that anymore because I noticed that fatigue could go down a lot quicker if I just do nothing and shorten the overall time of the deload. So instead of going to the gym five days out of seven during a deload and just doing less overall work, I now stop going to the gym for three to four days completely. Um, that also helps me to completely shut off, focus on other things, and get a break from the gym itself. It's a mental break as well. It's not just a physical break. And that that has worked well for the last one and a half years. I really, really like it. And now do it with clients as well. 
and it just allows us to keep the deload itself very short and very sweet and it's a true deload there is no loading at all so um since we are not weightlifters or powerlifters um, who have a high technical component with the training they have to stay in that movement pattern they have to practice the movement pattern no matter if it's very heavy or if it's lighter um, we can basically take time off without practicing certain movement patterns you're not gonna have to relearn how to do a curl or a lateral raise right um, but if you're for example a, a weightlifter you cannot afford not going to the gym and snatching for four or five days. That's not going to happen because your your technicality will go down so quickly that you would have to basically start from scratch again when you come back to the gym. So that's certainly a luxury when it comes to bodybuilding and hypertrophy training that the technical component with all these movements performed in these higher rep ranges um, is certainly not as high as with other sports. So that affords a certain freedom and I... Like I said, three to, take three to four days off. You might be surprised how good you feel afterwards and how quickly you can back to heavy weights. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool perspective. So last question to you on the training front. Uh, what are your thoughts on training frequency? So how many times do you generally like to train a muscle group? And then what is the most amount of volume and number of sets that you would cram into a, a single session? Mm -hmm. So training frequency is certainly an interesting one. And my thoughts on that are that I usually look at a person, at a client, and look at strengths and weaknesses. And based on that, I create an individual training plan that is suited to bringing up their weaknesses and maintain their strengths or slightly increase those as, as far as um, we are allowed to do that within a given training program. So frequency is closely linked to that and what we want to emphasize. And obviously increasing frequency for a certain muscle group is a great way to improve that muscle group. Now we also have to think about overlap. We cannot start squatting or deadlifting numerous times a week with heavy, heavy um, weight and higher training volumes. That is certainly something a powerlifter can do, but his training volume is a lot lower. So he can train uh, those movements numerous times a week, and a week, and he's also not working as closely to failure as a bodybuilder would. So, with training frequency, we usually fall in the range of one to two, uh, sorry, one to four per week, depending on what we want to emphasize with that particular muscle group. Um, when I say one, I mean I usually have people scale back on their training frequency with their stronger muscle groups, and we train their weaker muscle groups more frequently. Um, the research. Uh, seems to indicate that two to three times a week is best and we just have to see and see how everything fits into an overall training program and I think that is a good recommendation that most people can go by and as far as the training volume per session goes um, I really think you can go pretty overboard with it um, depending on how many times a week you train and how high your training frequency overall is and how many times a, tr a week you can go to the gym. So obviously it's also linked to how much time you can spend in the gym per session because um, I've, done, I've done some crazy sessions where I do like 25 sets for chest, 15 sets for delts and 10 sets for triceps. You can do that, and, but you just have to remember how long it takes you to recover from that workload and how your preceding training sessions are affected by that higher workload and you also have to include um, nutrition here because if you are training at those high training volumes your second job is basically eating and and also sleeping so those two things have to be on point as well for you to be able to handle such a workload right uh, cool man uh, this was awesome I really enjoyed this and thank you so much for dropping all this great knowledge I think people got a great insight as to how your brain ticks when it comes to training so um, yeah thank you so much for dropping all this great information so please just let people know where they can find out more about you your resources any kind of projects that you have going on so let yeah just let people know about where they can find out more about all of that Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me, Abel. I absolutely love talking about this stuff. Um, this is this is what I think about all day, basically. So um, as far as where can people find me, just Google my name, Valentin Tambosi. Um, I have a website, valentintambosi.com. I also have an Instagram account where I post regularly and try to put out a lot of the information I just mentioned in this podcast. Um, it's just my name written all together, Valentin Tambosi. And 
basically, if you have any questions, let me know. I try to help as many people as possible. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time today. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, man. And hopefully see you around. <laughs> yep. Yeah, amen to that. All right. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode with Valentin. That was a close call, though. We almost went through all the muscle groups and then missed the lats, which are one of the most important out of all. I guess we could have talked about the front delts some more, but it's not a huge issue since underdeveloped front delts are rarely an issue. But I think we did a pretty good job at covering everything. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, then please consider leaving a rating at iTunes on the Sustainable Self Development Podcast. Subscribe on YouTube if you've tuned in there. And yeah, that's all the plugging I have for today. So thanks for hanging around up until now and see you next time.